This is breaking news. Governor Murphy is giving an update on the coronavirus pandemic in New Jersey. Let's go to it now. Good afternoon. I'm honored to be joined by the woman on my right who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. To her right, another familiar face, the Department of Health's Communicable Disease Service Medical Director, Dr. Ed Lifshitz. Honored to have you both here. To my far left, another name uh, who needs no introduction, the Superintendent of the State Police, Colonel Pat Callahan. And I have a particular honor today to be joined by the guy to my left, who has been with us many times before, the great Attorney General of the great state of New Jersey, Kabir Graywell. Great to have you, Kabir. Also, we're here with Jared Maples, the Director of the Department of Homeland Security and Preparedness. Matt Platkin, Chief Counsel, will be with us later. And we have the other high honor of having First Lady Tammy Murphy in the House with us. As I noted yesterday, the pain and fatigue felt by many in our black and brown communities is real and it is palpable. It is an experience that many, most people, myself included, by the way, will never know firsthand. It is the pain and fatigue of decades, generations, at this point, centuries of inequality and systemic racism. It is pain that has eroded the ties that bind some of our communities and the men and women whose sworn duty it is to protect them. While the heart of the issue is certainly not limited to problems in policing, I have asked the Attorney General to join us today to outline the expanded efforts he and his colleagues across the state are taking to build upon their existing work to promote trust and strengthen the bonds between law enforcement on the one hand and the communities in which they serve on the other. The Attorney General and Superintendent Pat Callahan, to their enormous and tremendous credit, have undertaken initiatives to heal these breaches of trust in our communities. They have traveled across our state, building partnerships with faith and community leaders, residents and stakeholders, so that our transformations to policing and police culture are achieved through collaboration with our diverse communities. What we have seen across our state these past few days was the natural outgrowth of these efforts. Law enforcement marching side by side with their communities, some members taking a knee, joining their communities and committing to the simple natural law that black lives matter. Under the Attorney General, New Jersey has emerged as a national leader in true community policing. These haven't been words, but actions that have brought about a sea change in law enforcement, increased accountability, transparency, and professionalism, which bring us closer to a reimagined police culture. And now New Jersey will take further steps to deepen the well of trust in our communities, including the first update of our use of force policies in two decades. So to you, Grabir, I thank you. We all thank you for your commitment. To all the community members and stakeholders who have come to this work in faith and trust, I say thank you. And I thank all the members of New Jersey law enforcement for proving that when we work together as one New Jersey family, there's no telling what we can do and we can do so much more. I mentioned yesterday, words matter, but actions matter even more, and we're not letting any grass grow uh, on this front. I wanna switch gears, switch gears in a big way, and turn to a piece of data that we have not discussed here with you all, but which is one of the valuable points we have looked to as we have set our expectations for our restart and reopening, and especially as we set our target for entering stage two on June 15th. And I may ask Ed uh, to come in here uh, and play a cameo role if he doesn't mind. Let's look at this chart if we can, Dan. This is a chart of the rate by which the coronavirus spreads across New Jersey through each infected person. The scientists call it RT, the rate of reproduction. 
It's a gauge of how fast contagion spread. And with a virus like COVID-19, knowing that RT is vital. Flattening this curve has been just as important as flattening the curve of the overall numbers of new cases, which we've shown you for now many weeks. But from a data perspective, this curve has been perhaps even more valuable. And perhaps more than any other measure, it shows the importance and the impact of social distancing. When I issued my stay at home order on March 21st, COVID-19 was at a nearly unstoppable pace of spread. Each infected person, whether they were symptomatic or asymptomatic, by the way, was spreading COVID-19 to an average of more than five other New Jerseyans. That's right, more than five new cases for each infected individual. Within three weeks of our stay at home order being put in place, and by the time when our hospitals were at their peak stress, we had cut the rate of spread to roughly one to one. And today, thank God, that rate of spread is less than one to one, and we need to keep it that way. In other words, since March 21st, when the stay at home order was announced, and when we put in place our strongest measures for social distancing, we have cut the rate of spread by about six times. Without these measures in place, it is certain that our healthcare system would have been overwhelmed. A five times reproduction rate would be simply unsustainable for public health, even as this chart shows, cutting that rate to three would still mean COVID-19 running rampant. But guess what? Social distancing works. Wearing a face covering works. And even as we undertake a greater economic restart on June 15th, we will need to keep up with both of these practices. COVID-19 is among us, and there is no cure and no proven treatment. Right now, social distancing and face coverings are the only cure and treatment. Again, look at how far we have pushed down this curve in 10 weeks. An RT rate below one means we have a declining rate of spread. We have saved undoubtedly, we, you and we, have saved undoubtedly hundreds of thousands of our fellow New Jerseyans from contracting COVID-19, and we have undoubtedly saved tens of thousands of lives. So let's keep it up, folks. Even as we enter stage two, and then we begin the work toward stage three, our economic restart cannot come with a restart of COVID-19. Keep your social distances, wash your hands with soap and water, wear a face covering when you're out. It has worked and it will keep working. Ed, may I call a quick audible? Anything you wanna add on RT? Uh, thank you, Governor. As usual, very nicely done. Yes, as the numbers suggest, this is telling you the number of people that you would expect to get infected from one infected person. And very clearly, as the number goes above one, this number will go exponentially large in, in a very quick period of time, which helps explain why the cases exploded throughout New York, New Jersey, and through much of the country. Uh, so many people becoming infected from one person, and they infected some, so on and so on and so on. Uh, as this number goes lower, as it goes below one, as the governor was saying, once we get below one, the governor, the virus is no longer increasing. It's basically, if it infects one other person, you're staying the same. If you're infecting less than one person, you're uh, getting better and better as far as the outbreak goes. And that's what's happening here, and that's what's been happening for a while. And as the governor said, from your hard work and sacrifice has made this happen. There are different ways to, to you know, I, I, the exact number, whether it's doesn't matter, it's clearly less than one and it's doing well. And I would go a little bit further, even than the governor said, that when I've compared this to how other states are doing, New Jersey is one of the best states as far as lowering this number down. So we've gotten this number lower than all but a few states out there by most calculations. So yes, I do think that this is great hard work that the people of New Jersey has been doing, and I do think that's made a huge difference in this outbreak. Yeah, Ed, I think that's that last point is a, a pat on the back to everybody that is richly deserved. We have flattened the curves that we have both been looking at and this curve that you all have been monitoring privately, unlike any other state that I'm aware of. Uh, and we were in the thick of this, let there be no doubt about it, uh, ground zero for 
this virus uh, was the metro New York area, particularly in our case, the six big community counties. But let's remember every county's got cases, every county's got fatalities, and you all out there have been extraordinary. So hats off to you. Thank you, Ed, for that color. With that, let's turn to the overnight numbers if we can. Yesterday, we received an additional 708 positive test results, the statewide total cumulative 161,545. Here's the trend line of new cases. And as you can see with the slides we also just saw, you can see the impact of that decreasing rate of spread and the overall bend of the curve. The spot positivity is now 3.6%. These are from samples taken on May 29th. And by the way, there were 29,000 recorded samples on May 29th. Looking to our long-term care facilities, we are far from done fighting this. 33,318 positive uh, cases and the numbers of lab confir confirmed uh, fatalities associated with long-term care uh, remain uh, far below what we saw at the peak, but it is still 5,158 blessed lives lost. Our hospitals reported 2,372 patients being treated for COVID-19 field medical station, 21 patients. I think Judy and I think there's a little bit of an anomaly because a couple of the hospitals uh, didn't uh, come in with a Sunday report. So we're not, again, one day to the next. We're not um, uh, obsessed one way, good news or bad news. This is the uh, breakdown of hospitalizations across region. The number of patients reported in either critical or intensive care was 639, number of ventilators 459, that's the fourth consecutive day under 500, 151 new hospitalizations, 102 live discharges. Here are yesterday's, those numbers by region. As I've said many times before, we know some of these numbers can bounce around from day to day, so we cannot get lost in the noise of one day's report but rather we need to look at things over time to find trends. And we see from our hospital data, we continue to trend overwhelmingly in the right direction on all the vital indicators. Looking at just the past couple of weeks, we see many more green balls than red ones, and it's the green ones that have told us that we're ready for stage two of our trip on the road back. Moreover, these green lights are now outnumbering the red ones in every region of our state, north, central, and south, and that's why we feel confident we can enter stage two together. However, we cannot also lose sight of what's important, and that, remain, that means remaining vigilant and keeping up with social distancing, face coverings, et cetera. We're still at or near the top of the list in terms of patients in our hospitals and the number of residents we are losing to this virus. Yes, we have made and continue to make tremendous progress, but we can't let our guard down. You can see we're 15th in the nation among U.S. states and new cases per day. That's been dropping like a rock, and let's hope it continues to be. But we're still number one patients in the hospital and number two in America in fatalities per day. Let's keep all of this in mind. And with the heaviest of hearts, we are announcing that 51 of our fellow New Jerseyans have been lost to COVID-19 related complications. The total number now stands at 11,770 precious lives lost. Let's talk about a few of these un unbelievable human beings. Let's start right here with Flora Guerin. Look at that smile, bless her. Flora was 91 years old. She lived in Brick after spending most of her life in Morris County. She was raised by a single mother and Flora helped bring some extra money into the household by playing the piano as a young teen. At the one room Mount Freedom Schoolhouse, she met another boy named Lou Guerin, and they were married in October of 1947. Flora ran the household and kept their growing family tight and in line. And when Lou set out to start his own trucking business, Flora stepped in to help out there as well. Flora would go on to also work for the Randolph Township Schools, for m and Mars, and at National Religious Broadcasters in Morristown. Faith was a constant in Flora's life and she was a member of Dover's Trinity Lutheran Church, Redeemer Lutheran Church in Sakasana, and Blair, Blairstown's Evangelical Free Church. Her spirit of community was strong and Flora was one of the highest volume blood donors 
at Morristown Medical Center. She leaves behind her husband of 72 years, Lou, who, by the way, has also tested positive for COVID-19 a couple of times and is in the fight of his life. Please keep him in your prayers as well. And she also leaves behind their children, Kathleen, with whom I had the great honor of speaking yesterday, and her brothers, uh, Kathleen's brothers, that is Glenn Scott and Louis III, and their families, which gave her 12 grandchildren and eight great-grandchildren. May God bless her soul, and may God bless each and every one of her family. Next up is Mildred Goldman from Highlands, right by me in Monmouth County. Born and raised in Newark, Millie, was a talented artist and gifted athlete, especially in basketball and baseball. In 1948, Millie married Walt Walton Goldman, and soon they would move to Highlands to raise their family, and Millie never left. Spending the rest of her life along the Jersey Shore, she came to love as a child. Once her children were older, Millie worked at EAI in Eatontown, running the publication's control desk until her retirement. But she wouldn't let retirement slow her down, and she continued working in the publishing industry at Amend Publishing. Millie's artistic talents never left her, and her family recalls the tremendous creativity she would put into telling stories or inventing games for her children, her, great, her grandchildren, and her great-grandchildren. Millie was also never one to forget someone in need and took time to care for others in her life, including her many four-legged friends. She leaves behind her daughters, Linda, and I had the great honor to speak to Linda and also heard about Millie's and Linda's personal struggles with Superstorm Sandy, and Millie fell a couple of years ago, and she lived with Linda for a period of time. So Linda, her daughter Mary, who lives in Germany in Bad Humburg, uh, by the way, a town we know well, and her son John, their spouses, eight grandchildren, 22 great-grandchildren, along with nieces, nephews, cousins, and friends. Millie is now back by the side of her Walton and another daughter, Diane, who was Linda's twin and for whom Millie cared, among other family. She was 94 years old, and may her memory bring peace to all who knew and loved her. And finally today, we remember a special guy, Louis C. Schmidt. Louis passed away at Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck at the age of 74. He was a resident of Brightside Manor in Teaneck. And this what, among other things, makes Lewis so special. He leaves behind no surviving family. But he will always be a cherished member of our New Jersey family. And especially to the doctors and nurses at Holy Name, who made sure that Lewis was treated with respect and dignity and was never alone as he fought this virus, and to his caregivers at Brightside, you were his family too. They'll remember his gentle nature, nature and playfulness and his preference for ginger ale over water. I spoke with Mike Marin, the CEO of Holy Name yesterday, and it was a pretty moving conversation about the final days of this great guy's life. Let's all keep Lewis in our thoughts and prayers today, especially when you look out and see our flags at half staff, remember him. And for you, Lewis, go Giants. This is why we remember these individuals every day, because COVID-19, because of it, many families cannot get together to grieve as our traditions tell us that we should. And because of COVID-19, some of our family have passed away with anyone by their side. So it's up to us to be there for them. It's up to us to ensure that no one is just remembered as one of a big number, but that they are remembered for the lives they lived. Each deserves that basic dignity. And so before I close, I also want to give a shout out to some more folks across our state who continue to do their parts to help our communities remain strong. And as in so many cases today, we also put a spotlight on our state's tremendous diversity, which we wear as a badge of honor. Today, I want to recognize Burlington County Turkish community who have stepped up with donations of hundreds of masks, for responders and essential workers in both Willingboro and Edgewater Park, and more, by the way, is on the way. And soon, BCTC, as they're known, will be opening 
its own building in Willingboro with plans to have a pantry as well for residents who need help putting healthy food on their family's table. So to Burlington County's Tur Turkish community treasurer, Fatih Karatis and Vice President Jakub Koksaldi, here on either side, by the way, a Willingboro Township Manager, Dr. Sharon Rogers, and everybody at BCTC, I say thank you. And I also have to give a, a special shout out to my dear friend, Levon Babler Johnson, for sending us the information in that photo. That's everything for today. But before I close and hand things over to the Attorney General, let's keep in mind again how far we've come in 10 weeks and where we'd be had we done nothing to stop the spread of COVID-19. Again, back then one infected person was infecting more than five others, and today it's less than a one-to-one -one ratio. We, you, have slowed this virus significantly. Social distancing, turns out it works. Covering your mouth and nose with face covering works. So keep it up and we'll get through stage two of our restart and recovery and get on as quickly as we can to stage three. And with that, please help me welcome an extraordinary leader. You've been watching Governor Murphy Since give an update on the coronavirus outbreak in New Jersey. Country. We're now going to return to regularly scheduled programming on CBS2. For extended local coverage, stick with our streaming service, CBS in New York. This has been a special report from CBS2 News. We now return to our regular programming.